Hello everyone, this is Sumugi. Welcome back to our final section of the Ethernet Codex Unit Review. Now today we're going to talk about the Heavy Support Unit. Heavy Support Unit Internets are pretty versatile and they're pretty good at what they're doing. Now the point, their problem is most likely the point. Since we usually run two to three battalion detachments anyway, we don't have to worry about running out of heavy support slot. We usually have to worry about the point cost because everything in this section are costly, except maybe Biovore. All right, Biovore is the only exception here. Everything else is quite costly because they're mostly monstrous creatures. Okay, so let's get started. Now, let's start with the start of the month, or I should say the start of the uh, post chapter proof uh, release is the actual crane. Actual crane, as you can see, it is already a pretty good unit. Uh, we've been using it before chapter proof hits. You know, it's a good gunline unit to include if you run a Kronos battalion. It's usually good to include one actual crane as it doesn't hurt. Uh, it's uh, it was two hundred sixteen point for toughness eight and 12 wounds and it shoot with Blessed Skills 3 Plasma Weapon which was not too bad and now it got reduced all the way down to 170 points which is much more reason to bring it now if you run a Cronus Battalion or maybe Yorimacon, depends on the situation here. Now what does Extra Crane do? For starters, let's look at its weapon. The weapon is called the Bioplasma Cannon. It's a 36 inch weapon. Uh, it's a heavy 6, stream 7, AP 3 and two damage per shot. Now, you might want to think, hold on a second, heavy six? I thought it shoot 12, and it actually does, because uh, if this unit, if Axelcran uh, stands still, if it did not move in the preceding movement phase, then you get to shoot twice, which basically, mean, which basically means heavy six will now become heavy 12. And if you don't move, you also get uh, plus one bonus to your hit roll when shooting when, during the shooting phase, which basically make your uh, extra crane now from a blister skill of a four. Now it's a three. You only require a three plus in order to hit the bioplasma cannon, which makes it like a very valid shooting unit. You know, three plus blister skill is like the prime number. It's a good number for uh, sh uh, stand a uh, backfield fire support unit. It's really good for that. Now Exocrane fits in this category and now it got even cheaper. The only downside of Exocrane is like it's only strength 7. All right, it's only strength 7, so you cannot use Exocrane to uh, damage uh, enemy tanks and only also deals like 2 damage per shot. It's not D3 or D6 damage, so it's kind of like eh, whatever. So like usually, normally speaking, Exocrane only uses it to target something like Mm, heavy infantry, you know, heavy infantry like Primus Space Marines, or even just regular Space Marines, or like maybe Chaos Havoc sitting in the backfield, um, Necron Destroyers, AD Mac uh, Doom Crawlers, or uh, Raven Wings, like more like bikes, like bikers. They're also pretty good. Anything in between toughness three to toughness six is all under the uh, category of. Uh, preferred target for the plasma type weapon, which is strength seven. Now, extra crane can do that, which is great. But extra crane can also do a trick. Now, what you can do is you can activate a stratagem called uh, pathogenic slime. Now, what pathogenic slime does, it increases the damage of your weapon by one. So, what does that mean? It means now your weapon is strength seven AP three, damage of three, which makes it a valid choice of fighting enemy light vehicles. All right, so like I said, Rhinos, Razorback, um, maybe Predator, anything that's toughness seven or below are okay, preferably toughness six, which is better. Anything that's above toughness seven is not recommended. All right, maybe some, not something like a Lehman Ross or Land Raider or Imperial Knights. It's not preferred because uh, you will be wounding them on the five plus, which is not very, efficient. All right, anything that's below or equal to toughness 7 uh, with the stratagem is great, but anything um, that's below toughness 6, you can just hit them, attack them directly without activating stratagem and you can still see some good results. All right, so that's pretty much it, right? I mean, there isn't much to talk about the actual crane. However, since, you know, from the very first day I started making this tournament video, I promised to give uh, my viewers like the exclusive 
ideas or like little gimmicks of what you can do with this unit. Now, usually, okay, usually when you take um, extra cream, people usually just slap it onto a Chromus Battalion because, I mean, you should, right? Because Chromus Battalion gives you three roll ones to hit. And since your extra cream is not supposed to move anyway, so why the fuck not, right? That, that's the general consensus of where do you put the extra cream, which I agree, which, you know, like, Chromus is probably like the best place for um, extra cream. However, however, okay, Chronos is not the only place for Exocrine. I think it's actually pretty good to put in into your Magon detachment. All right, so how do I get to this conclusion? First of all, all right, um, if you go Chronos, right, your chance, your probability, or I should say Math Hammer, okay, um, on average, obviously, we're talking about average here, we can't... Um, calculate all the way to like actual realistic number but we can calculate the average the average success rate for your uh, plasmic uh, weapon if you stand still obviously is 66 percent and like i said if you have any ability that allows you to reroll once to hit you add another 11 percent which basically means 12 shots of the bioplasmic uh, weapon with chronos reroll one you have 77 percent chance to actually land the hit which basically means 12 shot will translate into 7.92 hits and then um, if you use chronos it will become 9.24 hits so it's a little bit it's like a little bit more than two hits you know if you don't use chronos it's 7.92 if you use chronos it's 9.24 which chronos is like obviously better right you get more hits however if you use your Magon, you lose the extra two hit on average you actually you lose the extra two hit but in uh, for the trade-off, you actually get your armor save from a 3 plus to a 2 plus because your Magon gives you extra cover save for even if you're not in cover, which is most likely the case for extra crate because its size. It's really large. It's very hard to fit it into like a room or like an undercover. It's really hard. So usually it stays out in the open. You know, extra crate usually stays out in the open. But if you go your Magon, you give it one extra armor, which makes it 3 plus armor save to 2 plus armor save. All right. Let's talk about um, the survivability, right? The survivability, if you get plus one to the armor save, you basically get extra 16% chance of surviving. Let's say a last kind of hit you, um, it's a AP minus three, right? So uh, with your three plus armor save, you have to roll a six in order to save the wounds. But if you have your Magond, then you probably only need a five. You need a five in order to save it. So. Basically, what you're doing here is you're trading a little bit more of a firepower for survivability. Okay, so let's, uh, for example, let's see. Hmm. One thing about your McGun is not just the survivability. Like I said in my last video, um, if you use your McGun, you also get access to the insidious threat. Wardle trait. Now, Insidious Threat Wardle trait allows you to ignore cover save. Okay, so ignore cover save makes your plasma cannon much more reliable when targeting something sitting in cover. For instance, like I said, uh, Devastated Space Marine, Chaos Havoc, or even sometimes maybe scouts, you know, Space Marine scouts sitting in cover with their um, camo cloak on. If you have an extra crane and then you have a, let's say, a um, of a melanthrope, you have a melanthrope uh, sitting next to Exocrane, and the melanthrope happens to be your warlord, which gives insidious threat, which makes uh, Exocrane's attack ignore cover. Then, not only you're getting uh, extra survivability for being uh, your Magond, you're also getting ignore cover. So, in return, if you compare this to what you get in Chronos, you actually get much more better value out of Exocrane, so to speak, because. Exocrine, uh, it's designed to target infantry. It's not really designed to target tanks. I mean, even though it can, if you activate strategy on medium to light tanks, but most of the time you're gonna use this to target enemy heavy infantry. So if you put it in your Magond and have a Warlord have a, with Insidious Threat sitting next to it, you're actually getting more out of it instead of just rerolling once to hit with your Chronos uh, High Fleet uh, adapt ad adaptation. All right, so you get plus one armor save. Well, plus one armor save. I mean, realistically speaking, you'll get a bonus cover save, even if you're not in cover, which is the case most of the time. 
you get ignore cover. So if you get this and compare it to Kronos, you can start seeing, okay, you know what? Maybe Exocrine doesn't have to be in Kronos. It can actually be in Yormagon and still see some good result. All right. Now let's talk about the next unit. All right. Let's talk about the Terran effects. Now Terran effects in this chapter approved also got point reduction. All right. It also got point reduction. And unlike Exocrine, Terran effects has to be. I mean, it has to be exclusively sitting in Kronos if you give it Rupture Cannon. Okay, but if you give it as a spray, it probably it can probably be Kraken, it can probably be um, Leviathan if you want to, but most likely Kraken, or yeah, pretty much that. You know, like it doesn't have, or maybe Yormagond. But if you're having Rupture Cannon, you have to, you definitely have to put it in Kronos Battalion because unlike Exocrane, which you know Exocrane targets infantry majority of the time, and it has. Um, 12 shots, okay, it's a weapon, it's strength 7, AP 3, so it's designed to hit infantry anyway, and it doesn't deal that much of the damage, so the impact per shot is not as huge as Rupture can Terran effects, alright, so since we have that as an intro, let's start talking about the Rupture Cannon, okay, so Rupture Cannon, I know this is like a, like a controversy uh, for Terran uh, forms, like they often discuss this about, okay, you know what, um, what is the good anti-tank for Terran unit? And people say, oh, turn effects with Rupture Cannon, Hive Guards, and blah, 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 right? Um, well, Hive Guard obviously is one of the solid choices here, but turn effects of Rupture Cannon makes me kind of like, hmm, I don't think so. I actually don't think so. That's, but that was before chapter approved, because back in the day, um, Rupture Cannon effects cost 238 points per, uh, per model, right? It has toughness A, 14 wounds, 3 plus armor save, which is really good, right? But it does not have does not have any sort of invulnerable save. And since it has a strength 10 weapon, okay, it attracts a lot of attention. Let's say if you're a Space Marine player and you're facing a Terran Swarm, they have Exocrine, Terran effects, and maybe Carnifex, right? Who do you shoot first? Let's say you have a lot of tanks. Who do you shoot first? I mean, the obvious answer is your Terran effects, right? I have to shoot your Terran effects, otherwise your Terran effects is going to do the most potential damage to my tanks. And I cannot allow that to happen, which I will spare your extra crane in the first few turns because I know extra crane is not going to be as big of a threat to my tanks, but terrain effects is. You might think about, okay, you know what, if it's a big threat, then why don't we bring it? The problem back in the day was, if you bring it and you get one-shotted in first turn, which happens more often than you think. If you actually bring it on the table, you can see this is the actual case here. It will get shot off the table first turn, no problem, right? Assuming you... <clears throat> did not prepare enough in terms of your threat uh, presentation. You didn't, pre you didn't present enough threat, then turn effects is probably like the first thing that goes down that will score enemy first blood, right? That's usually what happens. And people will start saying like, you know what, turn effects sucks. It gets shot off the table, turn one, and even if it does get to go first, and then I still won't able to, you know, deal reliable damage because turn effects is plus a skill of four, all right? And there is no way to improve it in any means, all right? It, it has no means to improve its blizzard skill, which is four, and it carries a low shot count weapon, which is a heavy three, uh, heavy three strength 10, let's see, um, AP three and D6 weapon, which if you stand still, obviously, like it's an extra crane, you can shoot twice, so it's a, it's a, practically it's heavy six, all right? Six shot of strength 10, AP three, D6 damage. I mean, this weapon, doesn't have that much of a difference compared to last cannon. I mean, it basically have the same stat, all right? Strength 9 and strength 10 does not have that much of a difference. They all wound toughness 8 on 3 plus anyway, unless you're using this weapon to shoot at toughness 5 unit, which is really rare, and you probably wouldn't want to do that anyway. So, let's treat it as a last cannon, all right? So, as a last, as a, it's a heavy 6 last cannon on the blister skill 4 unit, this weapon and this platform is really over cost. All right, it's heavily over cost. I mean, just look at other Imperian, Imperian units. All right, let's look at fucking um, Tri Last Predator from Space Marine. All right, Tri Last Predator now it costs like 190 points per model, and you get four last cannon shots on BS3, right? Because uh, two from the side and one and two from the main, so it's four shot of last cannon, which deals basically the same damage except one last and one last strength, which doesn't really matter. You still won't. Toughness A and on 3 plus, all right. Um, same thing goes for turn effects. And Predator only costs 190 points, uh, turn effects costs 238 points 
which is really expensive, correct? But now, all right, let's talk about now. That was before. Now that turn effects with Rupture Cannon only cost 208 point, which is roughly 200 point, but you get much more value compared to before. So with 30 point reduction, which might not seem a lot, but you have to think about like 30 point, that's, that's six Hormaguns. You know, like still, it might still not sound a lot, but if you bring two turn effects, that's 12 Hormaguns right there, worth a point, right? Or maybe more Venom Cannon, or maybe one extra pair of uh, Devourer on your Flyrins. It could be, you know, it could be that point that you're looking for if you take turn effects back in the day. Now, since it's only 200 point, does that mean it's, it is now worth it to take turn effects as anti-tank um, unit? I think the answer is yes. All right, you can you can tell I'm a little bit conflicted here. I I my I want to say no, but I have to say you know what? It's actually a yes now because two hundred point. If you compare this to a Trilas Predator, all right, which also got point reduction but not as huge. Uh, Trilas Predator got their weapon reduced by ten points, so now it cost one hundred eighty point for a Trilas Predator, but compared to one hundred ninety before, right? And turn effects. It costs only 200 each point, which is not really expensive. It really is not expensive at all. So now, let's talk about how do we keep turn effects alive. Let's say if I'm telling you that bring turn effects now, it's actually a valid choice. Then I have I'm obligated to tell you then what is the best way to do turn effects justice. All right. So how many turn effects do you bring? I think this is highly dependent on your army list. Let's say if you're if we're talking about a 2,000 point army list, which is um, the majority of the game being played, it's 2,000 or 70, 50, okay, depends on the situation, but let's say it's 2,000. How many turn effects do you bring in an army? I mean, obviously, thanks to rule of three, you can only bring up to three anyway. So your choice is actually pretty simple, one or two or three. I mean, that's the question here, right? So how many do you bring? I think this has to tie back to the Exocrine we talked about. I think these two beasts have much deeper relationship compared to other units. Back in the day, or right, back in the day when we talk about backfield artillery beast, usually it's two turn effects of one exocrine. Which it makes sense, it makes the most sense. Because if I only bring one turn effects, alright, but let's say if I bring one turn effects, um, the enemy doesn't really have a choice. I mean, that's the only heavy long-range anti-tank weapon you have so I have no other choice but to pour all my anti-tank firepower at you in order to eliminate you and to ease off the threat right so back in the day people bring two turn effects because that makes the most sense because if I bring two you probably can kill one and wound the other but you won't be able to kill both at the same time right I mean unless they have insane dice roll and you have insanely bad dice roll then two will die but usually they will only be able to kill one Right, roughly speaking, they'll only be able to kill one, which then you will still have a turn effect at full power ready to counterattack. Uh, the fact that this will probably happen already deterred your enemy from shooting your turn effects. Maybe, you know, maybe they will say, you know what, since I cannot eliminate both at the same time, why not just kill something else? Like maybe a fly ring with the synapse and stuff. Maybe we can do that instead of killing one with turn effects. That was back in the day. So, what about now? Do we still bring two? Um, do we still bring two and one extra crane? I think the answer to that has to based on how many hive guards you are taking. Okay, if you're bringing like six hive guards, uh, I mean obviously six models, not six unit, six hive guards, then you probably only have to bring one turn effects. You probably only need to bring one. All right, but if you do not have hive guards for some reason, then I would recommend get two, at least two. All right, the, don't get the third, obviously. I, let me correct myself. Not at least two, just two. If you don't have hive guards, or for some reason you don't want to bring hive guard, or you don't, or you want to make like a monstrous beast theme list, you don't want any sort of like medium uh, bugs, then don't take hive guard. Take Terran effects. Take two of them. All right, take two of them, and maybe two, one to two extra crane. I think. Two turn effects and one extra crane is the better option here. All right. So two turn effects basically you're telling your enemy, well, go ahead, pick either one. I don't care because you cannot kill both at the same time. I mean, maybe you can, but you don't know about that. All right. You can be very certain that you will kill at least one, but you cannot kill both. Killing both is uncertainty, but killing one is definite. 
All right, so if you bring two charm effects and one extra crane, then you will still have preserved, you obviously have to preserve your extra crane firepower, all right? Because if you don't bring any turn effects, if you just bring extra crane, then the same dilemma is happening again. Well, not exactly dilemma, more like um, you're giving your enemy freebies, you know, like free questions, free answer questions, right? It's like, I have one toughness eight beast. What are you gonna do about it? I was like, okay, I'll just shoot at you. I mean, I don't have to make any choices, right? Make your enemy make choice make uh, choices difficult ones too. Make it make them go difficult choices. Let's say you have one turn effects, one extra crane, and one group of hive guards, and he has basilisk. All right, he he's able to shoot anything he wants. He can shoot hive guards because it does not require line of sight. Okay, and strength nine weapon also means it it can actually reliably damage extra crane and turn effects at the same time. So you are basically giving basilisk choices, which is not. A bad thing. It is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing because now you're forcing an, your opponent to make choices, and when people make choices, they make mistakes. All right. When they make choices, they make mistakes. Depend on the situation. Depend on the battlefield. On the grand, grander scheme of things, they might sometimes make bad choices. Now, if you don't present such、um, dilemma for your opponents, then that will never happen. They can just easily target. Such as you know, like anyone who has like the basic knowledge of Warhammer 40k、uh, competitive or has basic knowledge of what your army does, then you're pretty much screwed because he knows exactly what you're planning on and what unit is the biggest threat to him. Or maybe he can just ask you, let's say, okay, what's the what's your anti tank weapon and what's your biggest anti tank weapon, and you have to tell him because unit stat is open knowledge. You can't lie to him, right? You have to tell him, and then obviously you make judgment and you will just kill your turn effects. So. If you bring rupture cannon turn effects, just bring two. All right, don't bring just one. If you bring only one, you better have a backup hive guard to handle your anti tank duty. Because if you don't, then you're pretty much screwed in the long range anti tank department. You're fucked completely, right? So if you want to bring one turn effects, at least have a squad of hive guard, which most people will. I mean, most people probably will. But if you don't have hive guards for some reason, then if you still want to bring turn effects, get two. Right, get to make your opponent make choices. All right, make them make mistakes. That would be great. All right, that's rupture cannon, but we're not done yet. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna split this video into two parts. Otherwise, there's no way I'm gonna finish everything in just one video. It's gonna be like two hours straight. So let's talk about the second weapon choices for turn effects, which is acid spray. Now, acid spray is going to be super amazing because turn effects, the model itself got point reduction. Which is awesome because now acid spray is even more competitive. Back in the day, acid spray is used as like anti-aircraft weapon. You'll be like, whoa, whoa, what the fuck? Like anti-aircraft? How does that work? It's a strength seven, all right. Well, if assume you didn't take degrading charge damage, it's a、uh, it's based on your、uh, monster strength, which is、uh, strength seven by default. Strength seven, all right. AP one, D three damage, and it automatically hits just like any flamer weapon. You'll be like, okay, you know what? You can burn some. Guardsman, you can burn some、um, Eldar guards,、uh, Eld Eldar guardian, or you can burn some Marine scouts. Okay, big deal, right? Big fucking deal. But that's not how you use it. <laughs> that's actually not how you use it. Even though you can, it's still a valid strategy. Just slip it into like a、uh, terrain site and deep strike it, and then spray his guardsman. I mean, it's still a valid strategy. That's one way to use it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying there is actually an alternative way to use it, which is attacking aircraft. Because unlike other flamer weapon, this guy has a range of 18 inches. It's instead of nine or eight inches. Normal flamer weapon only has a range of nine or eight. This guy has 18 inches. So 18 inches basically means what you can do is you can use this to deter enemy aircraft. Because let's say Eldar flyer, right? The Crimson Hunter. The Crimson Hunter. They since it's supersonic, it it have to、um, move in a straight line. So It actually has a restriction where he can move. Now, if you have a terrain effects sitting in the middle of your army, then within that eighteen inches, you actually deny his, well, sort of not landing, but like his move, the end of the movement zone. You know, like the zone where he, where the aircraft end its movement, you're actually denying it because if he ends the movement near your eighteen inch range, what you can do is it's stream seven. Okay, strength seven. Basically, most flyer only have toughness of six, so you can wound it on three plus no problem. And since it's two d six, it's heavy two d six, all right. And that's assuming you moved, which you will get no penalty anyway because it's automatically hit. So it actually 
minimize the effect of Terran Effects Blizzard skill for 4, alright? Because it doesn't matter what Blizzard skill you are, it automatically hits, you have just have to roll 2d6 and see how many damage you do. So, on average, you'll probably shoot 6 times, alright? You'll heavy 2d6 on average 6, and then it's, it's a 6 shot of strength 7, AD minus 1. The AD is not great, but that doesn't matter because the damage is d3. D3 damage is actually devastating, and the weapon automatically hits. It cancels out anything, any sort of modifier, your minus one to hit by hard to hit, or your um, weird psychic ability. I don't care, it doesn't matter, right? It just automatically hits you. And it's a range of 18 inches. So there's two ways to do it, all right? There's two ways to do it. Number one, you can just put it in the middle of your army and slowly move it forward. You can even advance this motherfucker, all right? Put it in Kraken. Right, put in Kraken, advance this motherfucker. Because even if you advance, um, well, actually no, you can't. You can't. You can't do that. I'm sorry. Brain fart. All right. I saw as a assault weapon. It's a heavy weapon. So advancing means you cannot shoot. Right. You can't shoot after advancing. So maybe not Kraken, but there's like Yormagon. All right. Yormagon is probably pretty good for acid spray because you don't have to advance. You just have to move forward, and you get your bonus armor save even if you're out in the open and you get your devastating acid spray attack. I mean, 18 inches sounds like pretty short, but against anything that really wants to get close with you, especially enemy flyers, which they certainly will, they're trying to get close to you because normal unit cannot assault them, so they don't have to worry about your ground troops attacking their aircraft, so they have the freedom of flying all the way to your base, right? And they can do drop bombs or just shoot, just angle it correctly and shoot at your character or something like that, you know, depends on the situation. but. If you have a Tyrannus effect in your Magond, all right, with the uh, with the asset spray, that's going to be pretty cool. You I know, mean, that's going to be pretty cool. And since the point reduction is on the base model, not the weapon, to rupture cannon. Now, a turn effects of asset spray only costs 17, uh, 170 points, which is very fair. All right, roughly one hundred seventy points. Can remember the actual point, I think it's 174 or something like that, can't remember, but it's somewhere along the line with that, which is really cheap, I mean it's very fair. Don't forget, turn effects is toughness 8, and if you give it your Magon, it's armor save from 3+, plus will turn into a 2+, plus, which is fantastic, right, it's awesome defensive capability. So that's pretty much it, that's pretty much it about turn effects, and if you're wondering why they didn't talk about the Flesh Bora Hive, the answer is, it's not just worthy. It's just simply not worthy to talk about it. I mean, flesh bore hive. I mean, I guess, I guess you could try to use it in conjunction with the stratagem, the um, the scorch bug stratagem, which allows your flesh bore hive to have plus one to wounds roll, which is I guess it's okay. I mean, it's a string is a strength five, right? It's a strength five, so wounding anything that's toughness eight or uh, toughness 7, it will wound on a 5 plus anyway, so if you give a scorch bug, it will wound on a 4 plus. And then since it's heavy 20, you can probably get some wounding, but it only deals 1 damage, so it's like, whatever, man, it's like, whatever, like, maybe if you drop it with a Tyrannal Sight, I mean, it's 18 inches, I mean, if this weapon is like 36 inches, I can use it as heavy bolter, then that will be fantastic, right, but too bad, it's only 18 inches, it's too short for a backfield anti-infantry weapon, but it's too weak for a close-up, deep-striking shock weapon. It's too it's too weak for that, and it's too short for being like a backfield shoot enemy infantry weapon. It's too bad, you know, it's too bad for Flash Bird Hive. And oh, don't forget, uh, Terran Effects has um, the uh, Stinger Salvo, which is equivalent of the Heavy Bolter, but it's only 24 inches. It, it comes with the equipment, you have to take it, you cannot choose to not take it, which is pretty no, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what happens, you know, you can't, you can't even choose to not take it, which adds another 8 point. If you're wondering why it's 208, not 200, it's because the 8 came from the Stinger's elbow. you know, just, since you're already paying 8 point for it, just don't forget using it, alright, don't forget to use it, let's say you turn the site, you drop your Terran Facts, and you just ask spray all the enemy, and then you forgot to use Stinger's, Stinger's elbow, which is, you know, it's pretty silly, just remember to use it, I mean, it's only a soul 4. String 5 AP 1, which does not seem impressive, but it can make a difference. So that's pretty much it about the turn effects. Let's move on to the next unit. Anyways, so I was talking about that these are war unit. So let's continue um, talk about the Biovores. Uh, Biovores, I briefly explained it back in the Zoanthrope comparison in terms of mortal wound damage. And I, like I said before, uh, 
Biowar is great because it's able to shoot uh, its mortal wound against unit of its choice compared to Zoanthrope which has to smite the closest target. But that was just talking about mortal wound comparison, alright? That's not all of it. Biovores, alright? Biovores, it's a pretty cheap unit. I mean, it got nerfed before. Back in the day, it was like, what, 25 point per piece, which is insanely cheap, alright? But now it's uh, 50 point per piece, which is kind of like, ah, eh, okay, but it's still not bad. I mean, you, I mean, you can still use it. It's a pretty reliable choice for uh, brigade detachment heavy support slot because it's so cheap. It's the cheapest option actually for heavy support. Not only that, Biovor is actually pretty good to mess up your enemy's deployment because if he knows that you're gonna drop Spormite in his crack in terms of his anti deep strike zone, then you might actually get a little bit more mileage out of it because if he's gonna spread out as much as he can in order to um, extend his anti Deep, uh, deep strike zone against you, then the Biofor is actually gonna get more mileage out of it because if I shoot at one of the unit and if if it's so crowded, then I actually don't have a place to place a spore mine, which is basically mean you know it's uh, you can't place it, it means it's destroyed. But if you're like a, like a little bit of a spread out, then I can definitely always put a spore mine if I miss. If I miss, I can always have a room for spore mine and I can even place it somewhere that's kind of like. I take hostage of both units. Let's say I put it like right in between of two of your guardsmen unit, and then you don't even know which one I'm gonna charge with. So it's so it's like so it's really crazy if you just you shoot sport uh sport my against the enemy. And like I said in my previous fast attack video, uh, when I mentioned harpy with the sport mines. Now sport mine, like I said once I, once again I'm saying it again, it happened. It works like this. Okay, you have to shoot first. You have to shoot the weapon first, which is the sport mine launcher. Uh, it's a 48 inch heavy one, so you can one shot per model, alright? But it's 48 inches, which is pretty long. Now you have to pass a 4 plus hit roll, right? You have to pass a 4 plus hit roll. Let's say if you hit, then you go down to the, um, you resolve the effect of the spore mine, which, you know, you have to roll a d6, and if it's a 1, um, then if it's a 1, then it's a fail. If it's 2 to 5, then it's 1 mortal wound. If it's a 6, then you get d3 mortal wound, yada yada, right? But if you miss, let's say if you miss the hit roll in the 4 plus, Let's say if you roll a two, then what happens is you don't actually lose everything. You actually get to spawn a spore mine. All right. Um, in this exception, you actually get to spawn a spore mine um, within six inch of the enemy model, but you have to be more than three inch away. So, realistically speaking, if you spawn the spore mine uh, next to, let's say. A very crowded guardsman squad. You actually have no place to place the spore mine because you will have to place it somewhere else. Because if it's really crowded, then you have to place it some disadvantageous place in order to get to, trying to charge in the same turn. But if it's really spread out, right? If you're trying to work on your anti deep strike zone, then you can spawn it much more freely. You know, you can spawn it like literally three inches away from the enemy because it says it says it right here. A single spore mine uh, model anywhere within six inch of the target unit and more than three inch away from enemy model. All right, and it says if the spore mine cannot be placed, it is destroyed. All right, so if enemy has a very tight formation, spore mine is actually not that great. But enemy has a very loose formation, then spore mine will see some play. All right, it's pretty good. Also, um, this work in your advantage. Let's say you can tell, you can even do this. You can tell your enemy, telling about if you get to. If you get too loose on your formation, I will get the most mileage out of my Biovore, so you better tighten them up a little bit. I mean, you can do this kind of like, I mean, this is smack talk, you don't have to actually do this, but anyone who has knowledge of this while trying to tighten a little bit of their formation, which will work uh, in your favor when you're trying to deep strike or trying to um, land your turn aside or your Morlock, you know, which will work. But I mean, this is open knowledge, you know, he has to make the decision himself, whether he wants to spread his stuff apart or put them together, it's his decision. But then again, the spore mine is used as like a threat propaganda, it's not even going to like do that as much damage. I mean, let's be realistic here, all right? One turn, all right, one turn, I'll probably do one more than wound per turn. <laughs> it's, not, it's not crazy, it is not like devastating, but spore mine, now since we're on the topic of um, the one mortal wound is not really that impressive. If you use it to shoot as guardsman, all right, then <laughs> you're not getting the most use of this. You have to use this to shoot as something that has high toughness, 
high invulnerable safe or armor safe, all right? Anything that's really hard to kill in traditional ways, you use barbers to slowly chip away their wounds, all right? And since if you roll six, you actually deal these three mortal wounds. So it doesn't have to always be like one mortal wound, all right? It can actually sometimes be maybe these three mortal wounds, maybe two or three mortal wounds for per spore mine, all right? It can actually happen. Now, which target is falls into the category? Obviously, Imperial Knights are in this category. It has high toughness. It has high invulnerable save uh, versus shooting attack, of course, not melee attack. Um, something like, let's say, anything that's... Or maybe Gilliman. You can try to do Gilliman. Oh, but you cannot shoot a Gilliman directly. But what you can do is you shoot something around him. Let's say he is very close to like a Devastator Squad, you can shoot at the Devastator Squad, alright? Shoot at the Devastator Squad and then charge that Sporma into Gilliman. <laughs> you can actually do something like that. It, the Sporma is not locked to the target you declare shooting at, alright? You can you can charge at any target you want later on in the charge phase because this is spawn in the shooting phase, right? So you can spawn in the shooting phase next to Gilliman and just run into it and cause more to I mean, Gilliman only has 9 wounds. Right? I mean, sure, it can revive, it can resurrect, blah, blah, blah. But if I can deal one mortal wound to Gilliman for 50 points per turn, I'll gladly do so. I'll definitely gladly do so. And it's potentially doing these three mortal wounds. And Barvor, you usually take them on between numbers of... Um, back in the day, people spam Barvor because it was really cheap and the mortal wound was king there. But now it's 50 points, so don't spam it anymore. Just take three, I think. Just take three, you either take three or take you or you take nothing. Don't take like one Biovore model. I mean, first of all, it occupy a heavy support slot, which like I said at the very beginning of the video, it's very competitive in terms of like fighting over a slot because you have so many amazing things to use Why occupying one single slot just for Biovore. Unless you're trying to make like a super cheap spearhead detachment for some reason, then sure, go ahead. You can probably do so like that. But unless, you know, unless that's the case, usually just make three models and consolidate them into one single unit and then put them in one heavy support slot. You know, you can do that. Oh, that that's pretty good. You can get three bar of voice for 150 point, which again is not it's not too expensive. You know it's 48 inches. You shoot three times per turn. If you miss, that doesn't matter, you still spawn a spore mine. And if you hit, then you deal more than wound. Alright, but I think the most important advice here, if I if I dare say, is that you have to choose the right target. Like don't just choose that random targets. I look at all oh, that, look at that Bane Blade. I'm gonna use Mortal Wound to chip the Bane Blade's health away. It's just not... <laughs> sure you can, I mean, it fits in the category of high toughness, but it doesn't have high invulnerable save. You can just use Heavy Venom Cannon or Rupture Cannon, or even freaking Hive Guard with Imperial Cannon can deal with it. Use this Biovore Spore Mine to deal with something that your traditional weapon cannot deal with. Like I said, um, Tyrant Effects Rupture Cannon, um, Hive Guards with its uh, Perry Cannon, or maybe your Crushing Claw, maybe it's just not reliable against something that has high toughness, high vulnerable save, and then you just use Spore Mine to slowly chip its wound away. And for what? For 50 points per model. It's not too expensive, and you can just sit in the backfield, no problem. It doesn't have to move, it does not need loud sight. That's the most important part. It does not, since it does not need loud sight, it basically means it will be pretty safe from any sort of firepower. Alright? So, and it's a somewhat mortar resistant, you know, like Imperial Guard with their mortars. This guy's toughness for four wound per model and it's four plus armor save, all right? Once again, if you put in Chronos, you can reroll the ones to hit, which I guess it's okay, but sometimes it can work against you. I know people deliberately move their Biovore in order to spawn a Spore Mine. How does that work, right? So on the four plus, you spawn, you don't spawn Spore Mine. On the four plus, it just hits, right? And then you do the um, mortal wound calculation, but if you miss, let's say, since it's a heavy weapon and it has a blister scale of a 4, if you move, right, if you move just maybe like even on 1 inch, or you can move 5 inch if you want to, right, if you can just move anywhere you want, you will have minus 1 to your heavy weapon penalty, because you moved with your heavy weapon. Now if you shoot, you will only hit on 5 plus. Some people do it deliberately just to spawn spore mine, reliably, right, which is, oh, it's, really depend on the situation. People who do that needs to know what they're doing, all right? Most of the time you want your stuff to hit, you don't want the stuff to spawn actual spore mine, which can be targeted down, but sometimes it can work as your, as your advantage. Say your gene stealers are on their way to surround a group of um, 
Imperial Guard or something. All right, that's that's it. They're on their way to surround something really important, and there's like a small pocket, like it it forms like a pocket, but it still has a window open. You can probably in the shooting phase, all right, in the movement phase, obviously you move your jeans to the blah blah blah, and then in the shooting phase, you use a fireball to shoot at the intended target, and then you spawn a spore mine to close the pocket. Since the since enemy model, unless it has fly keyword, but obviously we're gonna target something that does not have fly keyword, or something that Imperial Knights can just step over the unit, right? Um, then what you can do is close the pocket, close the gap, and then just complete a surround because they cannot move over the spore mine. Okay, so that's one way to do it, and that's pretty much it about the bar of words. Now let's talk about the <sighs> toxic ring, all right? You can tell why I sigh right there, because Toxic Crane, I know, I mean, it's a fantastic model, right? It's a fantastic model, it looks really cool, it's very hard to transport because all the tentacles flying around, but that's not the point. The point of the Toxic Crane is just, it doesn't fit in any roles, alright? I'll be honest with you, if you're expecting a good review of Toxic Crane, I'm sorry, just, no. And like, even with point reduction, um... It's still not worth the use. Okay, let's review this unit. Why is it bad? And what GW need to do in order to fix this unit, all right? Hopefully, hopefully there's some GW people listening to this. So, Toxic Cranes, toughness 7, 12 wounds. Um, it has a weapon, it's a weapon skill of uh, 3, which is okay for melee targets. Um, it has a weapon skill of 3 and strength 7, and it has a 6 attack per model. So it's, it's okay, it's pretty okay in terms of like attacking. The attack numbers and the weapon skill are good. It's good. It's valid. It's valid to use as a assault uh, unit. All right. If it has like a weapon skill of a four, right? Like uh, Harrow's effects, you know, then it's kind of like eh, whatever. Like I don't care. But since it's weapon skill of a three, which is okay as a dedicated melee unit. Now, let's talk about its weapon. All right. Let's start with the shooting weapon. All right. The choking spores and the massive toxic toxic lashes in shooting, alright? So choking sport is a soul d6, it's 12 inches, it's a strength 3, uh, damage d3. You can reroll all field wound roll for this weapon. As a matter of fact, any weapon I mentioned here after have this rule. You are able to reroll all failed wound of this weapon. Okay? So and also the choking sport uh deny the enemy cover safe, which doesn't really matter because you don't you don't have any sort of AP anyway, right? You don't have any AP and it's a strength three, yes you can reroll wounds. It's D6, it's sort of like a flamer thing, you can probably kill some guardsmen with it, but why am I paying like one hundred something point? Well, no, it's not even one hundred something point. Is that one just actually you know what? Why don't we just check now? I'm pretty sure it's not <laughs> hold on a second. The reason, okay, usually, you, you can tell, okay, usually I don't look up shit on my, uh, during the video, but that's how distant I am to Toxic Crane. Alright, Toxic Crane is 140 point. Alright, why am I paying 140 point-ish just to get a model like this, alright? It's 8 inch movement, which is, again, not bad, alright? Anything, there's nothing wrong with this unit except it does not have a dedicated role. That's the problem with Toxic Crane, alright? So choking spore, ignore cover, strength three, um, reroll wound, blah, blah blah blah, and you have massive to toxic lashes, which is eight inches even shorter. It's also D six, a so D six. It's strength seven, it's strength seven, AP two, which is mm, okay. I mean, it's sort of like a pseudo plasma, and you've got D three wounds of that, which is okay. You know what? That that's pretty okay. If you want to kill some uh, heavy infantry, that might be it. You know, that might be it if you get into 8 inches, alright? And also this weapon can be fired within 1 inch of the enemy, so it works like a pistol, and you can reroll all uh, failed wounds of this weapon. So strength 7 reroll wounds, so if you're targeting anything that's toughness 3, uh, basically you wound them on a 2+, plus because it's strength 7, and then you reroll 1, so you can reliably wound anything that's toughness 3. And since that AP2, even Eldarn with the good armor save have to worry about that. Now. What about Space Marine? Space Marine, you can wound them on a 3+, plus, and it's AP-2, so they will only pass the save on a 5+, plus. it's a D3 damage, so this thing can probably work against Primus Marine as well, or maybe sometimes, maybe vehicle, maybe sometimes even vehicle, you can probably do that, you can reroll failed wounds, so maybe that might be a good way to deal reliable damage, but then again, it's range of 8, alright? And the problem with Toxic Crane is that you cannot, I repeat, you cannot get within the range to make it effective, all right? Since it's a, 
All right, let's talk about the last weapon. Okay, let's say the weapon in melee, which has the exact same profile as shooting. It's also string 7, AP2, uh, D3 damage. Okay, it can strike six times, but except it can always strike first uh, with this weapon. So let's say you charge, you charge the enemy, and then and you didn't kill it, and the next turn, when, the, when your opponent's turn to fight you, your toxic queen gets to still fight first. All right, assuming they didn't fall back. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's pretty much about it, all right? And then... Uh, there's two special rules, all right. If you lose a wound, it kind of works like um, pile of wars. If you struck it in melee combat, all right. If if I lose a wound and if I roll d6 on a six, I get to deal a mortal wound to you, all right. And also, at the end of each five phase, I can roll d6 within one inch of uh, any uh, enemy model. So if I'm if within one inch of like six enemy model, I get to roll six dice. And then if it's a six, I get to do I get to deal one mortal wound, which is I guess it's sort of okay. And it's a frenzied death throws. All right, what it means is like it will trigger, um, uh, it will trigger on a six just like normal death throws, but it actually deals three mortal wound instead of these three mortal wounds when it explodes. So how do I talk about this unit? All right, like I said about this unit, like now it's one hundred forty point. Maybe it's not as bad as before. Or maybe it's not as horrible because back back in it was like what 157 point right I think something like that I recall it's like 157 point it's like why do I want to bring this model like anything this model can do I can do it with a Carnifex all right I want if I want to anti infantry I'll bring double sizing talons all right if I want to anti tank I can bring crushing claw all right and you only move one inch extra you only move one inch faster than me. Alright, you're also toughness 7. If this model is toughness 8, then I guess it's okay, but it's toughness 7. Alright, it's toughness 7, exactly the same as Carnifex. It has, yes, it has more wounds, right? The armor stays exactly the same. So, yeah, like, it's basically like a glorified Carnifex that is able to reroll wounds with it. It's a semi plasma weapon. Um, well, not semi, well, I mean, it is a plasma weapon in shooting and assaulting. Okay, it is a semi plasma weapon, but then again, I think this is a problem with. Uh, the weapon profile. All right, this is a problem. With weapon profile. Why does Axocrine, Axocrine's plasma weapon work, but Toxocrine's weapon, plasma weapon doesn't work? I mean, there has to be a reason, right? Why does it not work? Why does not people take Toxocrine? I mean, if you want to talk point, I mean, Axocrine's one is seventy point. That talks. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Axocrine's one is seventy point. Toxocrine is only one to forty point, and you get. Well, not as much volume in terms of attack. I mean, actually, can get to stay in the back and reliably deal damage on the three plus with twelve shots uh, per turn. But target screen is not really far behind. It's not that far behind, you know. Like one to forty point, I get to deal not only shooting. I also in melee, I get to strike you six times in melee, and I also get to shoot you uh, these six times in shooting uh, shooting phase. Right, I can do all that stuff, and I can reroll all the wounds. So there's a very high chance I'll definitely wound you. And with my weapon is all AP, uh, AP minus two, except for Choking Spore. Choking Spore does not have, have any sort of AP. With my weapon is usually AP two, I can reliably take your models away. So that's what Toxocrane does. I mean, that's what its role is. That's the official role, I think. That's what GW, when they make this model, they probably think about, you know, I have a monster that can reliably won't anything will probably be pretty good. But I think the problem with Toxic Green and the reason people don't use it is it's because like we don't need more of this heavy infantry killer. Like we honestly don't. Alright? We don't need to do that. And like I said, 40 game, Warhammer 40k is a shooting game. Alright? I'm sorry to all your melee uh, army lovers out there, but I'm sorry. It is the fact. Shooting is much more reliable compared to assaulting. All right. So in assault, if I want to deal with heavy infantry, I got gene stealers. All right. I got gene stealers. I got carnifex. I got 019. I got all this amazing stuff that's ready to deal with your heavy infantry. All right. If I wanted to kill light vehicle, like like I said, Castellan robots, uh, Necron destroyers, um, why don't I just use Exocrine and high guards? They can do the job much more better than Toxocrine. And Toxocrine has to be get in range. All right, it has to get in range to assault in order to fake to make that happen, which I think you'll probably know it's not going to happen. <laughs> so that's the problem with toxic ring, all right? It's a melee unit that has a plasmic type weapon, all right? That's a plasma type weapon that can 
direct its damage against infantry or sometimes maybe medium vehicle but i think overall you know overall it's not that great and also toxic crane has like one huge dis disadvantage right it's very hard to transport it, okay you, you might think i'm joking because competitively speaking like who cares about transport man we're talking about tabletop performance but it also affects tabletop performance if you think about it, in the eighth edition shooting all right any part of your body that is uh, shown to your enemy's loud sight will count as being seen you know toxic cream of all its crazy tentacles waving around right you might think it's transport problem but not only that it's actually a shooting problem because when i want to shoot at your toxic crane, all i need to do is just see one of your t tentacles that i can shoot at you no problem that's one of the actual problem because that's how the it, shooting works in this edition all right so that's that's it that's it for toxic crane. and let's talk about the card effects so let's move on to our final few units. Uh, we have the card effects to talk about. Now card effects, um, I'm just going to talk about uh, card effects uh, along with Screamer Killers and uh, what's it called? Uh, Thornbacks. Now uh, Screamer Killer and Thornbacks, they don't really have any significant advantage over original Velina card effects. All right? And Screamer Killer get one extra gimmick um, for the morale. Uh, the 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 enemy morale uh, effect and then the thrown back uh, gets um, uh, ignore cover so that's kind of like eh, whatever you know it's not too crazy but um, screaming killer and thrown back cannot have uh, customized weapon choices otherwise they can be okay but too bad they are locked into certain weapon choices so it's kind of whatever so let's talk about just current effects all right Carnifex as a core unit of Terranid army. The Carnifex is very versatile. It can actually carry uh, many types of weapons to deal with many types of situations. Now the first question people ask uh, when they first get in contact with Terranids about, okay, so how do I equip my Carnifex? You know, people keep saying bring Carnifex, but Carnifex is, uh, for beginners, Carnifex is one hell of a nightmare because you have no idea where to start. Everything looks appealing, everything looks kind of okay, and you don't know which combination is the best for con effects now i'm about to tell you what is the best and there might be some people say there is no best option for turning this it all depends uh from uh on the situation to how you equip your con effects but that's why i'm here i'm gonna explain every single scenario you will encounter and how do you want to equip your con effects accordingly there is no single one best out uh uh best option no but there are several options you can pick from in order to maximize your effectiveness depending on where you want to position the role of the set karma effects. Let's say uh, your army is designed to sit and shoot or maybe walk and shoot, you know, like a Yoramagan list, then maybe a heavy venom cannon with crushing claw might work. But if you are like an all out rush into your base kind of kraken list, then maybe you probably want sizing talent, crushing claw, tusk, and bone mace, you know, like something like that. It really depends on the situation. So why don't we explore each variation, like one by one, all right? So the first variation of Carn the common Carnifex outfit is the melee Carnifex. And when I talk about melee, I mean like all out melee. I can deal with any sort of melee scenarios regardless of what I run into. If I run into infantry, I have sizing talents. If I run into tanks and monsters creature, I have crushing claws, all right? So how do I equip this, all right? You get Tusk, all right, which is a head biomorph. You get Tusk as your head biomorph. You get Crushing Claw and Sizing Talon, okay? You get one of each, okay? And then you get Sporsis. Oh, by the way, Sporsis is just mandatory. It doesn't matter, right? It is absolutely mandatory to get Sporsis. It gives you minus one to hit for that card effects for just 10 point. There's no point not to take it. It is like the cheapest option ever to get access to minus one to hit, so take it, all right? And then you get Adrenal Glands, and then the final uh, tail option is kind of like situational. You can take it or leave it. It's all depend on you. It's bone mace. Bone mace costs two point per piece. Maybe sometimes you're making a list and you have like um, maybe two to eight point to spare, and then you can take extra bone maces on all your three card effects. You can probably try to do that. Now card effects. Okay, the melee card effects. What's aimed to do? Okay, when I take this 
set up. Okay, I have Tusk, which gives me one extra attack when I charge the turn. The turn I charge, I get one extra attack, which I certainly will if I go Kraken, because I can fall back and charge. So it doesn't matter if I lock in combat in my previous turns, I can always fall back and charge and get my bonus. Not only the Tusk bonus, but also the uh, the base bonus for charging, but when you charge with your Carnifex, uh, you get the Living Battering Ram, which a lot of people forget when they actually charge your Carnifex, is when you charge, you roll a 4+, plus and you, the enemy suffers one mortal wound, which is not a lot, but one mortal wound is still one mortal wound. You still want to remember that. All right, you want to remember to use the Immortal Battering Ram. Not only that, you also get plus one to your hit roll for the remainder of the fight phase. Uh, do mind you that this does not apply to next turn when it's enemy's turn say if you charge uh in your turn and you get plus one to hit and when it's enemy's turn to fight back and i don't mean in the same turn i mean his your opponent's turn in his uh, fight phase when he fight back your card effects and your card effects gets to fight back you do not get the plus one bonus because you did not charge in that phase okay it's unfortunate because that's um the rule is written that's how it works but uh for the phase you charge with your counterfax you get plus one to hit which is awesome because counterfax only has three plus uh no, four plus weapon skill so when you charge you get three plus weapon skill which makes your attack a lot more reliable and in combination of old one eye obviously if you have old one eye around you will bump the uh your weapon skill from maybe a three plus to a two plus or if you're using crouching claw from a four plus to a three plus so it's really 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 great okay so now counterfax Okay, so with Crushing Claw, the, the intent is obvious. You use Crushing Claw to tear down the enemy tanks. And the reason why I take Talon is because um, some people say you might want to switch the Talon with Death Spitters. All right, which is okay. It's not a bad choice. You can take Death Spitters. Because if you are advancing, uh, your business skill is 4, by the way. If you don't take Hand Sense, your business skill is a 4. And if you advance, your business skill becomes 5. So it's kind of pointless to take Range Weapon. There is another loadout for that, which I will get to it like later, all right? But if we're talking about like pure melee, like I don't do anything, all I do is advance and advance and advance. There's nothing that's stopping me from just keep on advancing. I don't have ranged weapon on me to make me worry about or make me walk into a dilemma of like, do I shoot and walk or do I advance and try to charge? You know, you don't have to run into, you have to, you don't have to um, make yourself into that kind of situation. Just take crushing claw, and sizing talent, alright, so if you run into enemy heavy infantry, you can still use your sizing talent, but do remember sizing talent only has a strength of 6, because it's a strength user, and your the Carnifex strength is only a 6, so it's strength 6, AP 3, and 3 damage, and this is exactly the reason why I said previously why a Toxic Ring is not needed, because Carnifex can already do the job better, and cheaper too, right? Alright, and Bone Mace. Now, Bone Mace is really optional, because Bone Mace uh, doesn't take away your uh, attack counts, all right? You have four attacks, right? Uh, five attack for having Tusk. Well, when you attack with your Bone Maze, it does not consume one of your attacks. It's in addition to the five attacks. So it's great. I mean, it's only two points. I mean, you know, like, if you really have points to spare, just give it a Bone Maze. You know, it's strength eight. I mean, it's only AP one, but that doesn't matter because um, it deals D3 damage. So it's a one extra hit, just it's a freebie. And if you uh, charge, with uh, in the same turn with Tusk, all right? Uh, well, actually, no, uh, Tusk doesn't really matter. Just if you're charging in the same turn, uh, the Immortal Battering Ram will bump your weapon skill from a uh, four plus to a three plus, and if you have a 019 next to you, and then you bump that attack from a three plus to two plus, so your bone base will hit on the two, all right? It's one extra hit, so why not? All right, so it's like, take it if you really don't have anywhere else to spend the point, but you can choose to not take it. It's completely optional for the bone base. Alright, so that's it for the MIDI card effects. I think um, there isn't too much to talk about about MIDI card effects and how do you position it, how do you run it. Usually what you do is just charge forward and charge directly at the highest threat target. Like, if you have enemy model that's sitting in the midfield, you know, like maybe a bang blade, then teach him a lesson. But obviously, don't use a card effects to charge. Use something else to um, soak up the overwatch first. And then you use your counterfeits to go in. Don't your counterfeits is cheap, relatively speaking. It's pretty cheap, but you don't want to use it to soak up the Overwatch. It's not just not worth it. Unless, of course, you're charging into a bunch of Marines and you have Gene Steelers behind you. Then obviously, by all means, use your counterfeits to charge to soak up the Bolter Overwatch. 
all right? And then you use your gene steroid reaction. You can do that, all right? So that's it about the mini counterfacts. Let's talk about the hybrid counterfacts, which I just briefly explained um, when I talk about the melee loadout. Now, how do you equip uh, hybrid counterfacts? You get enhanced sense, crushing claw, sporces, adrenal gland, all right? And then you get um, death spitters, uh, twin death spitters, okay? Now, this is a bit confusing for a lot of people. Okay, it's like, oh, why, like, what, what does this do? Okay, but by the way, the melee counterfacts loadout only costs 118 points, and it costs the exact same here. It, the hybrid counterfacts with the crushing claw, enhanced sense, forces, adrenal glands, and death spitter also cost 118 points. So, if you magnetize your counterfacts and you can play around with your list, you don't actually have to modify your list because it costs exactly the same point. You can swap them in and out and just try the effect for yourself because it costs exactly the same point. So when you're list building, this is a little bit easier for you. Also, now that aside, now since the point is the same, okay, let's talk about the effect. Well, how does this hyper counterfacts work? All right. The problem with the melee counterfacts is that people complain that they don't actually get anything done before they even reach the line, and they often die halfway uh, while walking to the enemy line and just get nothing done. So that's why uh, people design the hybrid version of counterfacts. Now, what you can do is uh, the reason we're taking hand sense over task is you can basically shoot as well as. Um, a shooty counterfacts would, but you still have crushing claw. Let's say you take counterfacts solely because you want to have the ability to, all right, if you're taking purely for end if you're taking crushing claw only, like I only take counterfacts because of crushing claw, then the hybrid build is for you, all right? Don't take the pure melee one because the pure melee one, yes, it costs exactly the same. You get one, one extra attack for the tusk. Uh, you get one extra option with your sizing talon. You get the bone mace, but you get nothing done while you're on the way there. Okay, so um, that's about it for the hybrid version of the Carnivax. Let's move on to the final variety of it, which is the shooty Carnivax. Now, it's pretty straightforward. You take anything that will benefit the most uh, for shooting. You take enhanced sense, obviously. You take a twin death spitter and one heavy venom cannon, and you take a spore cyst. That's it. That's all you need to take. And all of these shoot, uh, all of these uh, war gear combined, you get uh, 119 points. Okay. You, uh, the role of this card effect is simply just stand back and shoot. Usually you put them in chronos, but you can also put them in your Magon if you really want to. Uh, HV, uh, heavy Venom Cannon, which I will call HVC, is great because it's a uh, it's a assault D3 weapon, which basically means it will shoot twice on average. Obviously, depending on your dice luck. It will shoot twice on average. Um, it's only 18 point, which is cheaper than Last Cannon, but it has a similar stat as Last Cannon. It's strength 9, AP 2. I mean, it's not 3, unfortunately, but 2 is good enough. AP 2. And wait, actually, let me just double check. Yeah, it is AP 2, and it has damage of 3. So it's not damage D6, but you know what? Most of the time, I think having a solid 3 damage is much more reliable than D6 damage because D6 damage that means like the chance of you getting 1 or 2 is actually much you know it's it happens all the time you, you might get 1 or 2 but if you get just a solid 3 damage and since it's a solid D3 weapon you might shoot 3 times which is great you know like 3 solid damage is awesome now so um, and with the Kronos uh, High Fleet a high fleet special rule, you get to reroll the ones to hit. So what you do with uh, your shooty counterfeits, just sit there and maybe have, uh, you don't have, you, you don't need a uh, Venom Throw or Melan Throw because you have Sports as yourself, and then just shoot and shoot your HVC. And if there's enemy infantry come close, then you can use a Death Spitter to deter their light infantry. Now there's another way to build this, which I call a uh, Yormagon variation. And mind you, this is still pretty much a shooty counterfeits, all right, it's still shooting kind of effects, but instead of taking a uh, death spitter, you take crushing claw and keep everything else the same. You don't need adrenal glands, you don't need uh, the touch, you don't need anything, just enhanced sense, HVC, and crushing claw and sports. That's it, all right? You just replace the death spitter with uh, crushing claw. Now, crushing claw is actually two points cheaper, so if you take this variation, it will only cost one to 17 points, just like my hybrid. Uh, just like the, the 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 earlier, it's a the hyper version is a, a crushing claw with a death spitter, which is hundred eighteen point. But if you take uh, HVC, 
with Crushing Claw, but no Adrenal Glands, it's a 1 to 17 point. Because uh, Heavy Venom Cannon got point reduction in this chapter approved, so I think there, we will see more resurgence of the use of uh, HVC card effects, which if you pay attention to um, competitive turn the list, there's already people using card effects in conjunction with Jormagant, Heavy, Heavy Venom Cannon, Sportsis, and just Crushing Call and just Walk and Shoot. Like, this is already a thing. This is some, not something new that I come up with. It's already a thing. So now with the Heavy Venom Cannon got point reduction, we will see more of it. We will see a lot more people using this variation, and we will see great success. Okay, so that's pretty much it about card effects. And obviously, of course, if you take card effects, doesn't matter which variation you're taking. I mean, unless you're taking the final variation, which is the pure shooting card effects, you take Death Spirit with Heavy Venom Cannon, then you probably don't need 019. But if you have even just a Crushing Claw, then I think it's worth it to take 019. Because if you take a hybrid Carnifax, doesn't matter if you take Death Spitter or Heavy Venom Cannon, all right? Doesn't matter which range weapon you're taking, as long as you have a pair of Crushing Claw with you, it's almost worth it to take a 019 to walk with you, because 019 will bump your hit, uh, your hit roll uh, by one. So what you can do is simply walk up to the enemy and don't lose anything because you're still shooting, right? Get enhanced sense, you don't need to get tusk, you just shoot your way on the way to the enemy, and if there's anything that trying to come close to you, you have crushing claw, you don't have you have nothing to worry about. Alright, so since we finished talking about card effects, let's talk about the final section which is uh, Moloch, Trigon and Trigon Prime. My god this video is very long, isn't it? <clears throat> I actually took a break in between because my throat is actually getting dry for all the talking. I've made this video in one go, so yeah. Anyways, <laughs> enough rambling, let's talk about the Moloch, right? Moloch actually got the short end of the stick and this chapter approved. It didn't actually get nerfed. I mean, it didn't get any point increase or it didn't get any sort of like stat nerf or rule nerf. It actually didn't get any of that. It's just Trigon and Trigon Prime is getting point reduction because their three massive sizing talent is actually getting 20 point reduction. While Moloch with its normal teeny weeny sizing talent doesn't get point reduction at all. You know, so it's kind of like whatever, you know, <laughs> it's kind of sad, but whatever, but anyways, <clears throat> Moloch, what does Moloch do? You're basically paying 104 point for a toughness 6, 12 wound model, that's uh, 3 plus armor save, mind you, it's 3 plus armor save, which is pretty okay, versus anything that's not last cannon, alright, which is pretty okay, and it can deep strike within, uh, outside 1 inches away from the enemy, okay, so um, let's say, let's say if you, it's called a terror from the deep, Oh, actually, no. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, you can actually deep strike it within one, uh, outside, just outside one inch of the enemy, but you cannot be within one inch. So technically, 1.5 inch, maybe two inches out, you can do that. What Moloch does, okay, it's uh, it's able to deep strike out next to the enemy and cause mortal wound to the nearby target uh, within two inches. Okay, anything that's within two inch of the Moloch, you have to roll a d6. And obviously on the 1, nothing happens, on the 2 to 3, it's 1 mortal wound, on the 4 to 5, it's a D3 mortal wound, and on 6, it's a 3 mortal wound, alright? And this is uh, dependent on how many targets you actually manage to get within 2 inch width. Let's say you manage to get, like, just one target, then you and you only going to do, like, um, up to 3 mortal wound. But if you get within, like, 3 units within 2 inches of yourself by simply deep striking the very perfect spot, then what you will happen is you deal up to six more. And actually, hold on, nine more wounds. All right, three units. You get nine more wounds in total. All right, potentially speaking, obviously. So this is the big uh, deal for Moloch. All right. So for Moloch, what you do here is you put it in reserve in turn one, obviously, because um, since we cannot deep strike in turn one uh, per beta rule. Uh, a deep strike in turn one is not allowed. We can only deep strike in turn two. Obviously, if you don't play beta rule, then you can deep strike in turn one. But I just have to tell you that not playing beta rule is actually hurting yourself, all right? Because you want to prepare yourself in the coming beta changes. That I think deep striking restriction is going to be uh, a thing, all right? <clears throat> Even though they didn't decide it in this uh, fall FAQ, but I think that, like in next in the coming spring. The deep strike restriction is probably going to see some result. I mean, if 
if the deep strike restriction didn't happen, then you know more power to us. But if it does happen, you have to adapt uh, beforehand to see how it works in turn two. So what you can do uh, with Moloch is put in reserve in turn one, obviously, because you cannot deep strike in that turn anyway, and pop out in turn two. All right, you pop out in turn two, you deal immortal damage, but you don't get into combat. I mean, you can't get into combat anyway, because the turn you pop up, you cannot declare a charge. All right, you cannot declare a charge, and so there's two things your opponent can do. Number one, you can shoot you to death, which is the usual course, you know, because you're outside one inch of their unit, so they are free to shoot you as they want. Or number two, they're trying to assault you and kill you in melee, which, you know, they can probably do it, so when you deep strike your Moloch, you have to watch out if there's any nearby target that's really good at melee that can kill you, like Gilliman. All right, don't deep strike this thing anywhere near Gilliman, because Gilliman can simply come in and slash you, no problem. But if you deep strike on top of like a bunch of Devastators Marines, or maybe scouts, or tanks, like vehicles, that has no ways of defending myself in melee. I mean, obviously not Bane Blade, because fucking <laughs> Bane Blade can melee pretty well, actually. But tanks that can melee really well, anything that cannot melee really well, just pop next to them and see what happens. Usually they are going to shoot at you. And this is the main appeal of Moloch. You're basically paying roughly 100 points to get a distraction unit for your Carnifax, your Flyerins, your Tyranifax, your Axocrine. Why do I say that? It's because with Toughness 6 and 3 plus armor, you can't exactly kill it with like Bolter rifle. You know, you can't kill it with Bolter, you can't kill it with Last Gun, you can't kill it with um, Galvanic rifle, you can't kill it with all the traditional uh, battle line infantry weapons, which is going to be like the main source of damage you take when you pop up next to your opponents, right? The only valid way to actually take down a Moloch is to use last cannon or any sort of weapon with similar stat. So you have to use anti-tank, the dedicated anti-tank weapon to shoot at a Moloch in order to kill it eventually. If you use like something like plasma, like plasma gun, Strength 7, sure, right? I can wound the Moloch, Moloch on the 3+, plus, no problem, but this guy has 12 wound, man. This guy has 12 wound, and Plasma Gun deals, like, what, 1 damage. If you overcharge it, it's going to be 2 damage, but, like, big fucking deal, right? And you risk burning your Marine alive, so usually people don't do that. So the only solid, efficient way to kill Moloch is Last Cannon, and that's what we want. We want to pop this guy in turn 2, alright, to save our unit from being fired at. But this is, the, this is where the problem comes in. The reason why Moloch don't see a lot of play on the table is because we're not allowed to deep strike in turn 1. All right. So what happened here is, um, it, since you deep strike in turn 2, right, your opponents get one turn of shooting to target the unit he wants to shoot at. He can target your Carnivax, he can target your Tyranofax, he can target your Exocrane, Flyrins, blah blah blah. He can target all that unit first without worrying about your Moloch, because your Moloch is not even on the field anyway. Right? He's not even on the field. So since he's not on the field, he can feel free to shoot whatever he wants. But if Moloch is allowed to deep strike in turn one, what happens is you can deep strike in turn one and then your opponents have to deal with it. You will have he will have to choose. Like I said earlier when I talk about terrain effects, you have to make your opponent choose, make choices. That's how you make then make mistakes. You know, if you don't kill my Moloch, you know more power to me. What gonna happen is in turn two, I pop out, deal my mortal damage, and if you don't kill me or somehow don't finish me off, let's say if you didn't manage to kill me, then you let me escape with like a few wounds left. What I'm gonna do is unburrow again. I mean I mean burrow again. And then I will return in turn four. I will return in turn 4 because uh, in turn 3 I will, I will borrow and in turn 4 I can return and after turn 4 I'm just gonna stay there. I'm not gonna um, deep strike again because I might run risk of the game ending early and, and that unit will consider being slain. So that's not gonna happen. A lot of question about Moloch is people ask like, okay so there is a rule talk about uh, when if your unit did not arrive at the end of turn 3 uh, that deep strike unit is considered slain. This is a match play rule, all right? So people ask like if if Moloch um, submerge again and it's uh, can it arrive at turn four? Because if it did not arrive in turn three, it will be considered slain, right? But that's not true. The rule says 
if it did not arrive yet, then it's a considered slain. But obviously, if your Moloch have arrived on the field at the end of the turn two, which you should, you definitely should, then it won't be fall into that category. You, you already arrived, you just resubmerged again. All right, you resubmerge again, you can appear anytime you want, so don't worry about that rule. So that's pretty much it. There isn't too much to talk about Moloch, actually. It's just a distraction unit without an uh, appropriate rule to go with it. I just hope the beta rule doesn't, uh, especially the deep strike restriction, does not become true. I just hope that's the case, because if it does become true, then Moloch will see very limited use, because it... You know, it would lose so many, one extra turn of able to do mortal damage, and it cannot deep strike in turn one, then it's kind of lose the purpose of having a Moloch. Because the whole point is to present the threat next to your enemy's base. Well, actually not next to, I mean within your enemy's base. And then for most people who did not have much experience dealing with Terranus, they will be frightened by this monster. They will try everything they can do to kill it. Even for experienced player, even if that guy played Terranus and he knows exactly what's going on, he will still have to choose to shoot at your Moloch over your Carnifex because uh, your Moloch present an immediate threat to your uh, to the gun line, to his gun line army. Because if I don't deal with your Moloch, what, what's going to happen is your Moloch is going to charge me, and you will certainly make the charge because you're only one inch um, away from me, right? You will certainly make the charge. And you will delay my shooting attack, and I will not allow that to happen. So what I'm gonna do is divert all my firepower to you, and kill you. So make sure my gun line survives. I can postpone my uh, anti counterfax firepower a little bit. That's fine. But I have to kill. I have to deal with this threat immediately. And that's cool because this guy's only cost 104 point, right? It's 104 point. It's very cheap, it's toughness 6, 12 wound, you can't kill with plasma, you have to kill with last cannon, which is kind of like, you know, like, you're getting advantage over your opponent because you're forcing them to use last cannon to shoot at a toughness 6 unit, which is always fantastic. It's fucking awesome. And for what point? 104, right? Really good, but the, I hope the beta rule doesn't come true, alright? So that's pretty much it about the Moloch, alright? Now, obviously, um, if you play your Magand, you can use Moloch as a deep strike host, like a deep strike anchor. But I would not recommend Moloch, it's because the whole point of Moloch is to able to deep strike within one, I mean, outside one inch of the enemy. But if you use the the enemy below, the unit you deploy along with Moloch has to be nine inches away from your opponents, which is not possible if your Moloch is within one inch of your opponents, right? I mean, outside one inch. I'm sorry. Right? It's not possible. So Moloch as a deep strike anchor for your Magan, the enemy below, not a good choice. Not a good choice for that. The like Ravener does that job much better, and not even Trigon and Trigon Prime can do that job much better too. So let's move on. All right, let's move on to the Trigons. Oh, one last thing. I'm sorry, <laughs> keep forgetting. One last thing about Moloch. Its attack capability is actually not that bad. All right, like I said, it's actually a threat to your enemy. I mean, it's not like amazing like it can't kill a tank it can't kill like a vehicle it can't do any of that but it can however actually dish out some damage Moloch has seven attacks I mean of course it has only weapon skill of a four but that doesn't really matter isn't it because it has seven attack and it has one extra attack with the dissensible jaw right this jaw attack it's a strength six uh, AP3 which again is not that impressive D6 damage but you can make one extra attack with this. Uh, one attack can make with this weapon, okay? Now, the other six attack, what you can do, the other six attack, you can attack with your Sizing Talon, which, again, has no AP and only deals damage of one. You can reroll one to hit, but it's strength six anyway. Strength six versus Guardsman versus Space Marine is still pretty okay. I mean, you still wound most of them on the three plus or a two plus, depending on their toughness, so it's not bad, okay? You've got six attack on them. Um, since you have weapon skill of four, so on average, you get... Uh, three hits and after a wound you probably get two of them and then you make they make their save They probably lose one model, which is whatever, you know, it doesn't matter and you still have the jaw attack You can dish out um, You have to make the jaw attack actually by the way, so oh about the tail upgrade which upgrades good you've got a, a Three options here and I'll talk about it. It's actually the same with Trigon Trigon Prime So I'm gonna talk about it here. Uh, it's biostatic rattle and you've got the prehensile prince of tail and Toxin Spike. Alright, so you have three choices here. Let me explain what each choice does. Now, Biostatic Rattle is that every time you fight, you make one extra attack. This is one extra attack. It does not count towards your uh, attack uh, attack value. Uh, this is in addition to your attack. Um, if you if the model suffers on an unsafe wound with this, uh, with this weapon, then they 
add one to a morale test, which is kind of like whatever, you know, like I, I don't think that's gonna matter as much. I mean, add one morale test, you probably have to combine it with like the horror psychic power in order to make it good, you know, maybe that. But battle psych rattle, I mean, it's kind of like whatever, but it's AP1, just by the way. <laughs> it's AP1, but it's, you can only make one attack anyway, so it's not like the main weapon you can use. So, what about Prehensile Pincer Tail? Uh, this is the default choice I'll recommend because it's just pretty versatile. I mean, Strength 6. Uh, your strength user, AP nothing, and D3 damage. D3 damage is not bad. I, I'll take D3 damage any day. Now, each uh, you make one, attack, one extra attack. This is like the pure physical attack. It does not have any sort of special attack. You just make one extra attack of strength 6, AP nothing, and D3 wounds. All right? So lastly is Toxin Spike. Now, Toxin Spike actually costs a point. Biostatic Rattle and Prehensor Pincer Tail does not cost any point. But Toxin Spike does. Toxin Spike costs one point. But it's one point. You know, like, if you just... 199 point, uh, not, I mean 1999 points, and then you have a 2000 point roster, it's gonna drive you crazy. Then just take a toxin spike, you know, just to make it 2000. <laughs> you can probably do that. That's the only good thing about Moloch. But it's strength one, all right, strength one. But that doesn't really matter because it will wound non vehicle on two plus, regardless of your toughness. So this can be okay, like if you're fighting something like, um, Rave, Rave Guard, Rave Lord, Rave Knights, or probably not Imperial Knights, yeah, probably not. Magnus the Red, Motarion, or Gilliman, you know, anything that has like monstrous creature with high toughness, anything that has high toughness but not a vehicle, but Toxic Spike can be okay, can be actually okay. It will always wound on 2 plus, but once again, it only deals D3 damage and you can only attack with this weapon once per turn. It's only one, it's a one shot thing. Alright, so yeah, that's pretty much it about the tail weapon upgrade for Moloch, Toxin, uh, uh, Trigon, and Trigon Prime. So let's talk about Trigon and Trigon Prime. Actually, let me talk about these two units together because they're actually the same unit anyway. The only difference here is one provides synapse and also is a character and have a slightly better shooting weapon. And that's about it. That's the only difference here. So Trigon, all right, uh, all the other stats are similar. It's, it's still tough in the 6, and it's a 12 wound model. All right, it's 3 plus armor save, it's a 6 attack, so it's pretty much the same here with the Moloch. Uh, but the difference is they are strength 7, which is uh, make them a little bit more okay when compared to fighting vehicles. If you're fighting light vehicles, uh, strength 7 is actually pretty competent when fighting those targets. Now, let's talk about, and also they have weapon skill for 3 instead of a 4 like Moloch. So they are actually good mini combatant. You can actually use them... Uh, you can use them as not just a transport, they have their combat capability as well. And since they got point reduction, uh, Trigon now only costs 149 points, which is very, very valuable right now. It's much cheaper than before, because this is the only way other than Terreno site to carry a troop choice and to deep strike with them. Like, the, like Trigon Dragon Prime is your only other option here. Otherwise, you want to have to take a Terreno site, which and it's not only a hundred point, which is much cheaper now. But Trigon has its benefit. I mean, Trigon Prime even more so because it has Synapse. It provides Synapse for the Termagon Bomb, which I talked about before. Um, also, since it has Synapse, it also has the Shadow in the Warp, which can really fuck up the enemy cycler because you can deep strike within nine inch of them. And the Shadow Warp, Shadow of the Warp uh, effect, I think it's a uh, eighteen inches, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's eighteen inches. Yeah, 18 inches. They have to subtract one from their psychic test. And if you have a Chronos, a Chronos Trigon Prime, a uh, deep striking a group of like uh, devil guns, uh, yeah, you can really fuck up them a little, a little bit further. And also, since Trigon Prime is a character, you can actually give it a relic. But usually that doesn't happen. You don't probably, you probably don't want to give it a relic. It's a character, but it has it has a 12 wound, so you can still shoot it over. Uh, the other model, so it doesn't really matter. The character status doesn't save it from being shot at, but it's worth mentioning. It's a character. You can carry a relic if you want, or even make it into a warlord if you really want to. All right, so let's go back to the Trigon, the, tri uh, the Trigon and Trigon Prime. So let's talk about your weapon, all right? So except Tails, like I already explained what Tails does. They have the exact same armament here. They have the same choices, uh, Biostatic Rattle, uh, Prehensor Pincer Tail, and Toxin Spike, it's the exact same here. The only difference here is they have massive sizing talents, not sizing talent, like massive sizing talent, all right? These stuff are badass. It's because it's strength user, which according to them is strength 7, AP 3, and D6 damage, which is pretty solid when fighting 
light vehicles, like I said, like Predators, Castle and Robots, Necron Destroyers, uh, 80 Mac with their Doom Crawlers, and Space Marine with their Rhino Razorback, you know, some stuff, stuff like that. Or maybe Basilisk, which is Toughness 6. You know, anything that has Toughness 6 and Toughness 7 is your prime topic here. Prime topic here. But if it's Toughness 8, then it's not that great. Like, don't use this to attack anything that's higher toughness than 7, alright? 7 or below is great. Anything more than 7, don't use it. Don't use it to attack. It's not as efficient. But as, like, a pinch moment, then probably you can do that. But normal time, you don't want to use that, alright? So, Master Assassin Talon, since you comes with 3 pairs, but you only get 1 extra attack, this is confirmed in the... Uh, FAQ on GW, you can read it if you want to. Um, this, they have three pairs of si massive sizing talent, but um, the extra attack only is given once, which is also the reason why they reduced the point from 60 point to 40, because we're basically paying one extra pair of sizing talent without getting the benefit of it. So they kind of balance it out as it should be, right? So with this kind of weapon, we roll one and you have six attacks. You have six attacks for them with Weapon skill of the 3, strength 7, AP 3, D6 damage, not bad, not bad at all. So don't treat Trigon as like a fire and forget transport. It's like, oh, I'm going to use Trigon to transport my stuff and that's about it. Like, don't think it that way. Treat it as like a solid unit itself. It is a solid unit itself. Its movement is like actually 9 inch per turn. It's like after you transport whatever you're transporting, or maybe don't even transport anything. Just pop it or maybe even walk all the way with the Kraken uh, High Fleet. You can probably do that, but I wouldn't recommend it. Like you, Most of the time you just want to use it as a transport, but don't forget it actually, actually have an anti-vehicle, well, medium and light vehicle capability. All right, so let's see. That's pretty much about it. So let's talk about its transport capacity. It can, catch, it can carry a squad of uh, troop unit. Um, since the troops, so we don't... Actually, hold on. Yeah, it can carry a troop. So, like the good old Termagon bomb, we already talk about that already. So, it's like 30 Termagon with Devolver, just pop with Trigon Prime, which provides synapse, and then just shoot away with 90 shot. And you pop single minded annihilation, which make it into like 180 shots. So, it's like, okay, which is really good, right? Now, um, not only Termagon, you can actually use it on Gene Steelers, you can use it on Gene Steelers as well. but. Like I said in my Gene Steel video, usually you want to use like the one turn charge thing with the Swarm Lord. You probably don't want to use a Trigon to Deep Strike then because now Deep Strike only happens in turn two. So it's not as efficient, so maybe not Gene Steelers. Certainly not Horman Cons either. Alright, and definitely not Ripper Swarms because Ripper Swarm can already Deep Strike themselves. They don't need the help of Trigon. So they only leave us with one choice. Warriors. Yeah, that's right. You heard me correctly. The Warriors. Now, since the Warriors, alright, I still think that the only best way to play Warrior is to walk and shoot with their Sizing Talon, which is free, and then take Death Spitter and Venom Cannon and just walk and shoot. That's probably the best way, but if you really want to try something new, try it with a group of Warrior. It doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be like nine models per unit, which I mean, you can if you want to, but it doesn't have to, right? And you don't have to take Trigon Prime. You can just take Trigon because Warrior provides the naps themselves already. So you do that, Drop the warriors and then just shoot with your devourer or just attempt to assault in the same turn. Maybe you can use this as a behemoth because you can reroll the charge distance. Which you know, when you're gambling whether you will be able to charge on the, on the second turn, then you know that will be pretty important. That's probably the only way to make warrior viable with uh, bone sword and sizing talon and maybe adrenal, adrenal gland. Obviously, adrenal glands because you can improve their odd for advancing in the turn they deep strike. All right, so let's talk about more specific scenario. Let's talk about Yormagond. All right, Yormagond, this is where the fun is. I think this is the most essential part about Trigon, all right? So now that Trigon and Trigon Prime got point reduction, with Yormagond, the enemy below, Trigon become much more interesting because not only they can carry the troop choice, they can actually use as like a beacon with the enemy below, which you can carry any infantry any infantry, all right? So what does that mean? The whole book, right? The whole book here. Um, I hope that doesn't infringe the GW legal issues, whatever. But the whole book, right? You can take it and just browse the whole infantry units and see what unit is great. And I'll just tell you, Pyrovorus. Pyrovorus is infantry. You can 
use the enemy below, you can deep strike it with Trigon Prime or Trigon, all right, along with a squad of maybe Gene Stealers or Termagons, all right, you can do that. It's optional. You don't have to capture, carry a troop, but you can use Trigon as a proxy uh, for your deep strike the enemy below, all right, you can use Power of War. Zoanthrope is not a bad choice too. Like I said, you can mitigate the whole smite only, smite the closest target with the deep strike, right? Zoanthrope is not bad. Tyrant Guard is not bad too with Crushing Claw if you really want to. Tyrant Guard is not bad. Um, you can probably bring like a unit of three warriors as a troop choice with just nothing but Scythe Talon just to provide the synapse. Or you can save that point and then just pay for the Tricon Prime if you want to. And shock cannon, tar uh, hive tyrants. I'm sorry, brain fart. Shock cannon, uh, hive guards. Right. So, what you can do is, you drop like a like a unit of ten termagons if you want to. This is optional, but I I, I would suggest you drop a ten a group of ten termagons just to screen a little bit, and then you have shock cannon, uh, hive guards, and you just shoot at the enemy vehicle, especially in pure knights. Like I said in my elite video, you can use that strategy just to shoot uh, and bypass the invulnerable state because the damage deal with shot cannon is mortal wound if you roll a 4 plus 2 wound, right? So that's great. So that's Trigon with your Magon combination. Obviously there's more, you can dig in more in the codex and see what is the better combination, you can tell me in the comments as well. But so far I find like the best Trigon combination so far is... I still think is the Termagon Bomb with the enemy below and then you bring like a Neurothrope uh, because Neurothrope is also infantry you just spend one CP for Neurothrope or you can bring Zoanthrope if that if you want to pay more point for it but usually just Neurothrope all right so if you take Neurothrope with you you don't have to take Trigon Prime because you already have Synapse all right so when you pick whether you want to take Trigon or Trigon Prime just think about whether you need Synapse or not let's say if you're using your enemy below to take Power Wars you probably don't need Trigon Prime you know, or even Trigon at all, you can just take Ravener because uh, Power War does not need Synapse. They, their instant, instant behavior does not in, uh, influence their performance because their weapon automatically hits, right? And they only have three model per unit, so they don't have the morale test problem anyway. So yeah, and if, anyway, that's pretty much it about the heavy support of the Terranid. Um, in next video, I will do a recap of all the previous unit I talked about like um, uh, post chapter approved, you know, like the elite troop choices and HQ uh, things that got updated. I'll talk about them again, like a complete, like a complete video of it, like a small video of it. And then I will also include the terreno site, basically the drop path for turnets, as well as the spore assist into one video. So that's it. That's pretty much it about the heavy support of Terranids. I know this has been a very long video and I'm pretty much exhausted. So if I say anything wrong, if I stutter, just please, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried my best. But anyways, I love Terranids. If you got, if you guys got any questions or any suggestions you want me to adjust in my video or you have any problem with um, the content I provide, feel free to write comments. I don't care. Like, just let me know anything you need like give me any sort of like ideas for videos because i'm slowly running out of ideas <laughs> after i finish talking about codex i'm probably going to talk about chapter approved changes and maybe some deployment tricks for terranus and maybe high fleet but there isn't really much to talk about with high fleet anyway because it's pretty obvious and you can probably finish the whole video within just five minutes right so that's pretty much it i'm slowly running out content right if you want to know more than just like terranus I also like to check on the bags. I also play all these other races. You probably can't see it from here, but it's AD Mac, Space Marine, uh, Blood Angels, uh, Death Guard, Imperial Guard, Imperial Knights, and Tau. You know, I I know all these factions. I don't have models for all of them. I have some models for them, but not all of them. And if you guys have any questions where you want to know more factions, let's say you want to play, you want me to talk about Death Guard, or you want to talk about AD Mac which I really want to because AD Mac is really interesting. Let me know, all right? Let me know if you guys need anything. I'll try my best. I love Warhammer. And that's it. That's pretty much it for the video. And I hope you guys have a good day. And I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.